no longer slaves to the flesh, no longer slaves to the law. We are now free, free to new life, free to the spirit that moves in us, free to trust in God's love. Chapter 8 of Romans is a treasure trove. Uh, there's so much in this one chapter that there's no way we could possibly touch on it in one sermon. Uh, so I do encourage you to watch those video devotionals throughout the week that will probably should touch on some of that stuff that we're missing today. Uh, but also take time to read it yourself, to read the whole thing, because there's some really good stuff in there. But foundationally, I thought important to stress today that very point. That in our new life in Christ, we must trust in God's love. We are free to trust in God's love. God has undone those chains that bind us to decay. And he hopes that we will be liberated from that bondage. But it is our choice. Picture being bound in chains and he comes and he unlocks them. And they fall to the ground. But we have to do something then. He has loosened those chains for us, and he hopes that we will make the choice to step out of that bondage, to be liberated from that decay. When we are made free, we have to make the choice about what comes next, because those choices are no longer being made for us. There's a lot of different theologies out there about how God interacts with humanity. You've got the God who pulls the puppet string. But then you have the God who loves us and gives us freedom to make our own choices. He gives us free will to do and to be in this world. We must choose a direction. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to choose to go back to sin. I don't want to choose to stay in the same place with my chains sitting at my feet. I choose not to forsake the gift of freedom, and I choose to go forward, forward into what comes next in this new life in Christ that God has called us into. It is important to note that when we talk about these things, we recognize that we are talking about past, present, <coughs> and future. God freed us. God is freeing us. And God will free us. That is the process of sanctification that Rob talked about a few weeks ago. And it is important because sometimes when we become Christians, we think, oh, we stood up here, we professed our faith in Jesus Christ, and now we're good. But there's a process to becoming holy. There's a process to growing in our new life in Christ. We're not done. So no matter where any of us each individually is in our walk with Christ, there are moments when we have to start anew. We have to see new life. We have to take new steps. We have to start over. <clears throat> but starting over is hard. No matter what we are moving forward from, whether it's this new life in Christ in general as people of God, as children of God, or something more specific, it can be intimidating. First steps are wobbly and scary for a toddler. Picture toddlers and they're falling all over the place. It's scary. But it's scary for us to take first steps too. Think about a time when you had to change to a new school or a new career. Or maybe you had to step forward out of bad habits. Maybe you just had to wake up this morning and choose not to hold on to some long-held anger or hurt. Whatever it is, you make a choice, and then you put one foot in front of the other, and then the other, and to become, until it becomes natural and normal. It's not easy. But it has been said that nothing worth doing is ever really easy. We don't grow from easy. We grow from challenge, from choice, from moving forward and pushing ourselves. The good news in making the choice to move forward is that we are never alone. Chapter four, or Verse 14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God, we have received the Spirit of God, 
And we are being led into this new life in Christ. Not alone, not by ourselves, but with the Spirit. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 4. In it we are told that God chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. We can trust in God's love because God's love is a choice. His choice. He chose us. I don't know how many of you remember um, being in grade school, middle school, uh, and I thought this was a thing of the past, but Samuel has recently told me it is still a thing. But you play kickball at recess, and you know you're among friends, and you've got your two team captains, and your captains have to choose their teams, right? You've got these guys, and they're like, okay, I want you, and I want you, and you are standing in that row just waiting to be chosen. Do you remember what it was like to be chosen first for a team? Do you remember how good that felt? On the flip side, do you remember how bad it felt when you were last to be chosen? How much that hurt? It hurts your self-esteem. It makes you feel unwanted. Now how much more amazing is it that God chose you to be his child? He chose you. He chose you. He chose you. And he chose you. All of you. There was no line of first and last. He chose us to be his children. Verse 15 goes on to talk about the doctrine of adoption. And I love that this explains what God, God's choosing us looks like. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. And that's a fancy word for saying he's the only son that actually came from God the Father. As opposed to us who are born from two human beings. But then God adopts us. In adoption, a parent or parents go through a lot of red tape. They pay large sums of fees. The process is painstakingly and heart-rendingly long to adopt a child. But when it is all finalized, an adopted child is for all intents and purposes their child, just like any child born from them. That child has all of the rights and responsibilities of being in that family. Just the same when God chose us, he adopted us and he made us co-heirs with Jesus. All of the inheritance of the Son is shared with us because we are now also his children in all manners, never to be undone. We share in the rights and the responsibilities and in the joys and in the sufferings of the family of God. And I think that's evident when we come together in church and as the body of Christ, we share in the rights and the responsibilities that come with being a part of this church family. We, we come together, we share in one another's joys and one another's sufferings. We come alongside one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a foundation that we can build on because it's not of our own doing, but the doing of the one who created us. We can trust in God's love because God's love is unconditional. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 is just one of the many passages that tells us this. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. While certainly God does not want us to continue to sin, he forgives us because he loves us. Paul tells us nothing can separate us from the love of God, and that includes everything you do or don't do, you say or don't say, nothing. <coughs> This may be hard for us to understand because we seldom do things without a reason or a condition. But there are no conditions placed on God's love for us. How many times do we hear in the Bible about God using somebody that did not have the best reputation? King David, for example, was an adulterer and he arranged for the death 
of his beloved's husband in battle. Or Paul, the very man, the very apostle who wrote this book that we read from today. As a younger man, he was a persecutor of the followers of Jesus. Until he was made a new man, made alive in Christ, coming into his new life in Christ. God loved, the, loved them, and God loves us, even in our sin. We can trust in God's love because God's love is eternal. Isaiah 54, the Lord says, The mountains may, be, may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed. God's love never ends. It never fails. It is everlasting, and we can have hope because we know he will never stop loving us. It abides. And I just love that word, abides. It means it rests upon us. It's stable. It's unwavering. It's just there to stay. We can trust in God's love because God's love is sacrificial. It is a love of action. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, which is, of course, from the most widely known verse, John 3, 16. God loved us that much. God loves us that much. The Greek word that is used when referring to the love of God is the word agape. And it is often interchangeably translated as charity. This is because God's love is one of giving, sacrificing, acting. How can we not trust in a love that someone has sacrificed so much for? A love that shows us over and over again its depth for us. This is a foundation that we can build on. Because trusting in God's love assures us of who we are and whose we are. Our God invites us to cry out, Abba, Father. Our God is for us, not against us. Our God justifies us, giving us a Savior to intercede on our behalf. You are a beloved child of God, not a conqueror. Not a sinner, not a sheep to be slaughtered, not the self-doubt that you see when you look in the mirror. You are a beloved child of God. I love that this chapter comes on the heels of Ash Wednesday, because as we recounted at our Ash Wednesday service that we are dust, and to dust we shall return, we were reminded that neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God. Paul states in verses 38 and 39, nothing will separate us from the love of God. I've said that multiple times because I need to impress upon you the truth in that. Today, in addition to remember that we, remembering that we are from dust and to dust we shall return, I want us also to, to be reminded that God created something beautiful out of that dust. We came from dust. But look around at the beauty that he brought from that. Look at one another. Look at yourselves. He created something he loved so much that he gave his only son. You, me, each of us, we are his beloved, beautiful children that came from dust. Now there's this video that I wanted to show, but I decided that you would much rather go to lunch than have me show today. So, um, I'm going to post it on social media later and uh, try to link it to our YouTube and send the link out throughout the week. Uh, but it is a video of a song called Beautiful Things by Gunger. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Gunger. Um, but somebody has taken this song and they've made this beautiful meditative video. And in it, it talks about how God makes beautiful things out of dust. How God makes beautiful things out of us. It says that in your pain, in your hope, in your chaos, 
in your love, in all things in your life, that you can trust in God's amazing love that emboldens you in this new life in Christ. It is truly magical, and I uh, look forward to sharing it with you. Because no matter what, no matter how we feel, we have to remember that God created us for a purpose. Out of his love, he created us to glorify him, to love him, to share his love with others. Before we return to dust once again, we can trust in God's amazing love. And from that, we can love ourselves. We can love one another and we can take part more fully in this new life that he calls us into. That new life that we're walking into, that we're making the choice to step into, it must look different than it did yesterday. Each day needs to look different. God chose you. The Spirit is leading you. The Son intercedes for you. And you can take that first step in full assurance, being made new by trusting in God's amazing love. Let him who created you continue to make beautiful things in you out of his love. To God be the glory. Amen. Let us pray.